thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak to you about a project that we've been working on for about seven years now. Um, it is a big group effort as many uh, ocean science research projects are moving toward uh, as costs become scalable and the cost of doing research at sea gets greater. And so this is a, a big part of a big project called the Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration, Research, and Technology. There are 16 different cooperative institutes uh, around the country. Each of them essentially is set up to directly partner with NOAA for specific goals. SciOrt's specific goals are to explore frontier regions in the eastern continental shelf in the Gulf of Mexico, to improve understanding of vulnerable coral reef ecosystems, and especially extending that into those deeper coral reef ecosystems that not much is known about, to develop advanced underwater technologies for sensing that environment, and then lastly, to translate all of that into outreach and education opportunities for students and the general public. So it's a, a true consortium. It's led by FAU Harbor Branch. We have a co-managing partner in University of North Carolina, Wilmington and two additional partners of University of Miami and SRI International over in St. Pete. So all of us came together to work on this uh, kind of big overall objective. And what I'm going to talk about is one piece of SciOrt that's been taking place over the last seven years. So we're in year seven of a 10-year award. And so far, we've had about $11 million to all of those different projects uh, in the neighborhood of about $600,000 to this project. So. Becoming a cooperative institute gave us an immediate ability to collaborate more directly with our NOAA partners. And in fact, there's an incentive in the grant itself where if we're collaborating directly with the NOAA partners, so there's some cost incentives in terms of overhead and other things. But it's a way that the government can really get more bang for their buck while still engaging outside expertise beyond just their own agencies. So in this particular instance, FAU Harbor Branch and UNCW have partnered with uh, the NOAA Coastal Center for Ocean Science, so NCOS, Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, and I'll tell you quite a bit more about the sanctuary as we move forward today. And then lastly, we've gotten additional funding from the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program that funded some of the uh, first three cruises that were involved in this project. So it's been a really uh, excellent way for us to, from the get-go, design the science with the management objectives in mind. Frequently, one of the biggest criticisms of science is, how are we going to translate the work that we're doing into positive change? And by working with those research, or excuse me, those resource managers from the get-go, we can design studies that are going to answer the questions that they need to answer to effectively manage their resources. So that's how this project was conceived from the outset. So we're here over in FAU Harbor Branch on the east coast of Florida. And the area I'm talking about is all the way across the Gulf of Mexico, but it's roughly at the same latitude. So two or three times a year, we make a long drive over to Galveston. We used to fly, but now we send too many people, so it's easier to pack up a van. It takes about 18 hours. We get there and have three hours to unload everything off of the, off of the van, get it all on the ship, and head out to sea overnight. It's about a six-hour run from Galveston out to the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which is roughly 100 to 105 miles offshore of the coast of Texas. And it's this extensive reef system that essentially is along the edge of this continental margin, where salt domes have pushed up through the soft sediment to create hard substrate that corals can recruit to and settle on over many, many generations. And so it's a relatively old reef system. One of the most interesting things about Flower Garden Banks is that even though it's latitudinally very high, so for example, here off the coast of, of FAU Harbor Branch, the only reefs that we have of any significance are deep coral reefs like the Oculina Banks, San Lophelia, down deep where they're cold, they're existing without any photosynthesis, and they're completely dr driven by feeding in cold water. They don't need to be warm. Most coral reefs, when we think about them, are shallow and tropical. So Flower Garden Banks, even though it's at our same latitude, gets enough warming from the Gulf of Mexico that can support a relatively tropical habitat in an otherwise temperate air environment. The other thing to keep in mind, anyone have any idea what these are? Oil rigs. So we are not doing this in a pristine vacuum of a system. 
Uh, in fact, from the middle of East Flower Garden Bank, you can see about 20 oil rigs at night all lit up. And in fact, there's even one now uh, non-operational rig that is within the boundaries of Flower Garden Bank that is scheduled for, uh, for potential removal um, here shortly. But it's a, a potential influence on the system for sure. And one of the main reasons to understand the fisheries in this area, understand the ecological resources, is so that we know what we have, we know how we need to protect it in light of this extractive use. So the project I'm going to talk about today is, called, is part of the overall Cyort Mesophotic Project. And I'll get into what mesophotic means in just a moment. But overall, our objectives are to product, uh, produce a really detailed, uh, spatially explicit characterization of multiple areas within this region, both within the sanctuary and in additional banks adjacent to the sanctuary. And I'll show you some of those banks on a map in just a little bit. We really want to establish what the baseline fish community structure is for this re region, and specifically to tie the habitat structure to the fish that are connected to that habitat. NOAA has a description called essential fish habitat. And if an area is considered essential fish habitat, it has different protective regulations than an area that does not support active fisheries. We also wanted to look at the differences between these shallow and deep corals in the same area because shallow and deep corals are under different threats in different regions. Um, here off the coast of Florida, just a little bit further south of us, shallow corals are almost always much more exposed to coastal anthropogenic stress than those deeper mesophotic and deep reef counterparts that are a little bit farther offshore. In addition, there's different light regimes going on, different temperature regimes, so we would expect there to be some differences in those communities. But up until now, there's not been a whole lot of work done in that middle light zone. So we wanted to look at some of those similarities and differences. Fourth, we're really interested in this idea of connectivity. And the sanctuaries programs overall are interested in this idea of connectivity. We have a series of banks along the northwest Gulf of Mexico. We have coral populations around the Gulf of Mexico, coral populations that extend around the coast of Florida. Cuba, Bahamas, Belize, everywhere else. And we don't yet have a really strong handle on how those populations are interconnected to one another or if they exist in total isolation. And the same way it's important for road managers in Florida to know how many people are coming in and out every snowbird season to affect proper management, we need to know how many organisms are coming in and out at each generation or each season to develop management strategies to protect those as individual locations or a nested strategy to protect the entire region. And so with the idea of management in mind, our overall goal is to provide this data and information for more effective management strategies for the Northwest Gulf of Mexico. And this is a strategy that we use uh, really in all of our Cooperative Institute uh, exploration work. So, what is a mesophotic reef? Who's been snorkeling or diving on a shallow reef anywhere? Quick show of hands. So that's the vast majority of people. Which of you have made it below 100 feet? A few, that's great. So in most places throughout the Caribbean, once you get below roughly 100 feet, you'll notice that roughly 50% of the light starts to drop out. Right? So you're losing light that gets absorbed and scattered by particles on its way down. So once you're down beyond roughly 30 or 40 feet, number one, you're beyond the recreational dive limit. So you're starting to get into things like decompression. And you're starting to get light limitation be a big factor for the organisms there. If we go beyond somewhere between 100 and 200 meters or 300 feet, given on, depending on where you are in the ocean, you get to this completely aphotic zone where less than 1% of the light is penetrating down. So the entire system is driven by heterotrophy. There's no photosynthesis going on whatsoever. So this is the deep reefs, things like the Lophelia reefs that wrap all the way around the coasts of Florida at roughly 500 meters deep. Or big, huge soft corals like this metallogorgia. The disc top part of that metallogorgia is almost three feet in diameter. And the stock part is almost two meters, six feet long. So these huge soft corals that can exist down deep. In between these two is that mesophotic. So meso means middle, 
photic means light. So mesophotic are the middle light reefs. So what we tend to see is they're still driven by photosynthesis, but different morphologies overall. So look at the structure of these corals. They're all spread out, really flat. They're trying to maximize that amount of light that they're getting that's downwelling on them. So you see more extensive flattened habitats. This one here is called Pulley Ridge. It's off the southwest coast of Florida. And this is one of our shots from Flower Garden Banks. So here are the banks themselves. Remember, Flower Garden Banks and Stetson Bank are part of the existing sanctuary. So they've been protected since the 90s. Um, fishing is allowed, but only hook and line fishing. Uh, no net fishing is allowed, no bottom fishing, no traps, anything like that. Um, and generally, any kind of bottom tending gear of any kind is not allowed in this sanctuary. Now, there's a number of banks that extend eastward along that continental margin. And there's three that we've really focused on in addition to east and west Flower Garden Bank. That's Bright, Geyer, and McGrail. One of the things I want to point out while I've got this map up is that most of the shipping traffic goes right along the edge of this continental margin, hooks around Flower Garden Banks, and then heads in towards Galveston and Houston. So it's a major shipping thoroughfare right across the bottom area of these banks. And I'll show you this map again when we get to the individual sites. So we use two research vessels to access these sites that are almost 100 miles offshore. The first is called the RV Manta. It's an amazing boat. It's 84 feet long, completely aluminum construction with two huge jet drives. When the hull's clean, which is really only the first week of the season when it gets out of the boatyard, it can do in the neighborhood of about 30 knots. It's an incredibly fast boat. Um, but most of the time when we're working on it, we cruise at about 17 knots or so because it's more fuel efficient. Um, it's a great boat because it has, it's set up for dual purpose. It has two big platforms for diving as well as a really good A-frame for using remotely operated vehicles. The other vessel we've used for, uh, not for ROV purposes, but to do a bunch of diving off of is the Noah Nancy Foster, which a much larger vessel can hold many more people so that when we need to go out there with big dive teams, a boat like the Nancy Foster gives us more capability than a boat like the Manta. So I'm gonna go through kind of the different methods that we use to explore these, these different areas. And the first are remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. So ROVs are small tethered robots that are actively interacting with the surface as we use them. So here's a shot of the Mohawk ROV, which is the one on the bottom left. This is our newer model uh, being deployed off the back of the Manta. So it's got this long tether that allows us to not only control it, but operate the cameras and be streaming live data and information up off of that ROV in real time into the ship. The Mohawk was a recent addition in about 2014. And the sampling skid that you see here on the bottom of the ROV was built right here at Harbor Branch. So they purchased the ROV off the rack and then ROV adapted it for sampling and extractive use. The previous ROV that we used up until 2014 was called the Super Phantom. It was essentially a robot that had a forward facing camera that was standard definition, a downward camera that was standard definition. We now have full high definition capabilities on the new ROV. So it's a, it's a big upgrade for us. And it's operated, both are operated by the UNCW Undersea Vehicles Program. So ROV work is one of the, I will say, slightly less glamorous at sea things you can do. You're out on a boat, it's beautiful, and you spend all day trapped inside a dark cave, essentially, watching TV. So here you can see operation of the ROV. It's done with multiple joysticks and for those that are you know, 30 and younger that played video games their whole life, they excel at this. There's one of our grad students, Jen, who picked it up in about five minutes. Um, but it has really fine manipulation, really fine control, and it can move in six degrees of freedom. So up, down, left, right, forward, back, and it can spin. So it's a highly maneuverable instrument. The rest of us either spend our time on the back deck deploying and recovering, or we spend all day sitting at computers, watching the TV screen, and live annotating the data. Now there's two reasons to do this. 
One is at any given moment, we could have a failure, so we want to be logging as much as we can at any given time. But the second is there's so much data and so much information streaming off of the ROV and so much uh, biota in all of the images. If we don't make an at least a general attempt to say, hey, this was a really cool part at time X, it would take us forever to go back through all the video and find that spot again. So live annotation is a way to make us more efficient in processing the imaging and the data later on, especially when we're trying to correlate the timestamps on the video to when we sample the coral, for example. So in addition to sampling and live data annotation, we're constantly taking uh, forward-facing video. That's primarily to uh, categorize the fish community. And there's a downward-facing still camera that takes pictures every 30 seconds. And each of those pictures looks a little bit like this. If you zoom in, you see those two little red dots right there? These are two parallel scaling lasers. So we know the exact area of every single image that's collected. So then we can get spatial coverage of anything that gets picked up in every single one of those images. So we design transect protocols to maximize the amount of coverage we can get and try to figure out exactly what's on the bottom down to the lowest taxons we can see off of each of those images. The other way we sample is through diving. And we do both shallow, kind of conventional scuba diving. It's easy, it's fun. You can see the people on the left are having a blast. Jeff's part of that team, he's sitting right down here. Technical diving requires a lot more gear. You're gonna be in the water for roughly three hours. You're gonna get very cold, so you have to wear quite a bit more neoprene. You have to more, wear a lot more weight to account for the positive buoyancy you're going to develop in your tanks, your air tanks, as you breathe them down. And so you'll see that the, those of us on the right, on the tech teams, tend to be a lot more serious and focused. Uh, and this repeats day after day after day. Um, but we always tend to meet up at some point. So one of the things that works really well is as the tech team is ascending, the tech team is under decompression obligations. So they're going to have to hang out in the water, off-gassing uh, bubbles out of their bloodstream for a good period of time. So the shallow team usually meets us. We can hand off gear to them, hand off samples to them, and they can move up to the boat, and then we'll meet them as soon as we're done with our decompression obligations. So some of those tech sites look like this. Those large, deep plating corals. Notice we don't travel light in any way, shape, or form. I mean, sometimes we even just bring along a bucket that essentially serves as a trunk for us to either carry corals or anything else that we need to move. And the way we survey on uh, diving is quite a bit different from what we do with the ROV. So we can be a lot more explicit and bring down a quadrat. And the quadrat essentially allows us to account a little bit more for the curvature of a lens on a camera because we can adapt each of these pictures and bow it to make sure that the frame is perfectly square and know that that image has no distortion whatsoever. And then we can do the same things. We can count the number of corals, the percent coverage of the corals, the percent coverage of algae, et cetera. And then the last tool we use is fish acoustics. And this is passive fish acoustics. So there's a number of fish that have air bladders or swim bladders in their body and if you send a pulse of sonar through the water column, you can actually get reflection off of the in inside of their swim bladder. The way that signal is modulated can tell you how big their swim bladder is. And so you can not only count individual fish, you can count their relative size. So you can see here in this figure, we pick up a lot of gas plumes, all shown here in brown, because those are air bubbles too, right? But then we also get the bubbles that are inside the fish. And so each one of these is a fish, and the relative size of that bubble is how big that fish was. So we can go back and forth using this passive acoustic method to get a, a broader picture of the total number of fish that are present in an area. It's not going to tell us anything about species. It can tell us about size classes, but nothing about species per se. And so we've done this over a big area at East and uh, West Flower Garden Banks as well. So, of our total number of expeditions, I think we've had 12 or 14 now to date, somewhere around there. Um, we've done 334 ROV sites, 218 
shallow diving sites, 84 technical diving sites, and roughly 900 kilometers of fisheries acoustics. So a huge amount of sample size given the area and the, the challenge of getting out there. And what we look at is basically the benthos, so what's on the bottom, percent cover in terms of abundance, density, the fish abundance and density and size classes and species uh, for the ROVs. And then we sample the corals themselves. So to date, we've taken 171 coral samples. And I'll talk about what we do with those samples later on in the talk. And then we've also done a transplant experiment to look at how corals change when you move them from one area to another. So to remind you, we're at East, sorry, East and West Bank, Bright, Geyer, McGrail. I'm going to start with these two. And then we'll move over to these three over here. So if we look at just the sanctuary itself, Flower Garden Banks proper, it has amazing biodiversity given where it is latitudinally. It's got 24 species of hard corals, at least 60 species of soft corals, many of which are black corals, about 850 other reef invertebrate species, 125 algae species, and that's probably a vast underestimation. Not all of the algae have been well characterized there. And in the neighborhood of 250 fish species. So on par with areas right off the coast of here, right off the coast of, say, St. Lucie Inlet in terms of fish diversity. So here's a couple of representative shots of what it looks like at Flower Garden Banks. So as you get down into that roughly you know, 60 to 70 meter reef crest area, the top of the reef, you get these huge mounding corals, uh, some of which are fully intact, like this alive portion, others which are in various states of, here you can see that this probably started here, it died, and now it's been recolonized by other corals up here on top. As you move off the sides of the banks, you get into huge areas that are basically coral fields. Less species diversity, but even more coverage. So if you look here, we're starting to get off the sides into about 140 feet, 130 feet of water. And we get these big fields of a pencil coral called madrasis. So madrasis can have very fast growth rates. It can grow like a weed across the whole meadow of a, of a coral area. But it's very susceptible to breakage. So for example, a couple hurricanes came through and we observed areas where areas, and I'm not exaggerating, as large as this auditorium essentially experienced a landslide of corals, where that whole sheet buckled and broke off. And so it's a very dynamic area. We tend to think of corals as these static areas that have been there for hundreds of years, and that's not necessarily the case. There's going to be change over time. There's also huge fish out there relative to what you might see in Florida, 80-centimeter, uh, four, you know, three-, four-foot-long grouper all over the place. When we tried to classify the habitat types of flower garden banks, it basically broke out into five different areas. We had that coral reef cap. It was completely dominated by coral and on the order of 50 to 60 percent coverage. Deep reefs, where we started to get into that mesophotic zone. All surrounding the areas are basically bare soft bottom that are not as bare once you start to look closely. We have a lot of algal nodules. So these are little rotoliths that are grown up by the calcifying red algae themselves, and then kind of this pavement of coral and algae that's more dispersed. So these are the five habitat types that we, uh, that we identified with our NCOS partners. And then if we look at those different habitat types, and we even broke out the, the uh, coral cap into high relief and low relief, what we wanted to do was ask the question of how are these different habitat types different from one another and how are fish distributed in these different habitat types. In other words, if the sanctuary has to make a decision about which of those areas it needs to protect, which one is the most valuable for fish? So we did what's called a stratified random sampling design. So we distributed the number of sampling points within each habitat type proportional to the extent of that habitat type and then randomly, randomly distributed our samples within that, uh, within that portion. So you get this kind of overall, here's where we're going to go, take the ROV and start sampling. And each of these is a circle. And the way we do it is we drop the ROV in the middle of the circle. And then we work out from the circle 
exactly 100 meters, and when we get to 100 meters, we're at the end of a transect. So we've got hundreds of these 100 meter long transects across the reefs. So the results of that, in a nutshell, are up on the coral reef cap, incredibly high coral cover, 38 to 57 percent. Anyone hazard a guess for what Florida has? Three? About three percent. So this is an order of magnitude more coral per percent cover than what we have here in Florida. So incredibly healthy reef overall. Very low macroalgal cover on flower garden banks, less than 3%. Another indication this is a really healthy habitat. And it was dominate, uh, dominated by two corals, Monastrea and Orbicella. These are two big, mounding star corals. On the deep reefs, a bit of a different story. Very low cnidarian cover, only about 3 to 8%. So cnidarians are anemones, soft corals, hard corals, everything lumped together. Dominated by a hard coral called madrasis, one of those pencil corals, and by a number of black corals, a kind of soft coral. But the vast majority of it, if you just look at it from a 2D perspective, is soft bottom. This is a little bit deceiving because a 2D perspective looking over the bottom isn't going to tell me that there's a four foot drop right here, right? So all over the place on deep reefs, and here's a good example of it, we've got this vertical rise with lots of biota tucked into all of those little spaces in the vertical rise. So what we found out from this is that for big planar areas, 2D bottom typing works great and 2D images work great. If you're in a highly vertical habitat, 2D images are not going to work very well at all. We also looked at the density or the number of individuals per unit area. So sclerotinians uh, just mean hard coral. Just think of bone sclera. So sclerotinians are hard corals. They have a calcium carbonate skeleton. So if we look at the density of hard corals, essentially what we see is that up on the coral caps, we have relatively high density. This is extremely high. So 10 to 20 colonies per square meter of individual coral colonies. So again, pointing to this idea that flower garden banks is incredibly unique and incredibly healthy. If we overlay fish density, and I've broken it out by grouper and, grouper and snapper, because those are the ones fishermen tend to care about the most, here you can see that it's a slightly different story. So we might have expected that high relief coral reef habitat would be the best habitat for fish. But in fact, it's those marginal areas of deep reef along the edges of our reef that are probably more important grouper habitat versus the shallow habitat. Snapper, even more dispersed. So again, further out into these algal nodule areas, big fields of rotolith plains is where the snapper tend to be. At the other banks, McGrail, uh, Bright, and Geyer, not put a map up here for Geyer, I apologize. Um, we did not have detailed benthic habitat maps yet, so we couldn't do a stratified random design. We didn't know what those five habitat types might be or if these banks had more than five or less than five habitat types. So we did just a completely randomized sampling approach instead. Same idea, you put up your boxes, you pick randomly where you're gonna do your dives, drop into ROV, do a 100 meter transect along that area. And what we ended up finding in these areas is similar to what we saw in the skirted, deeper parts of flower garden banks. So lower sclerotinian cover, 2 to 11% two to here at Bright Bank. The corals that are there were mostly Montastri cavernosa, that greater star coral shown over here. And it had kind of a weakly defined coral cap. So there wasn't one particular area like East and West Bank where it came up and there were corals everywhere. Instead, there were pockets of corals in different areas dispersed along the top of the bank. And there was much more crustose coral and algae at Bright Bank than we saw at, in, at either uh, East and West Flower Garden Banks or McGrail or Geyer. You play that one for me. The other thing that was extensive at Bright Bank was remnants of anthropogenic influence. 
lots of anchors. I think we counted seven uh, during our, our time there. This was a excavation pipe that was used for treasure hunters that were looking for a Spanish galleon that they left behind. Lots of long uh, line, anchor line, cable. Um, definitely not an area that has been untouched, per se. A gyre bank, instead of those kind of flat coral and algae fields everywhere, we saw lots of the algal nodules in what would be considered old reef. So limestone structure that had been built up and then eroded back down into this craggy kind of moon-like lunar landscape everywhere. So here's a kind of a shot of some of the rubbly areas. Here's a shot of some of those kind of eroded areas. But then around the margin of the bank, there was this fringe of hard coral and black coral that basically extended along one whole side of the bank. So huge plumapathies here. This is almost a meter in diameter. And you can see thousands, eh, hundreds, maybe thousands of small fish fry all sitting in that little ledge right along the edge of the, of the bank itself. It also had a much higher fish abundance. And remember that Geyer Bank was the one that essentially lies right in that fishing lane. So one of the things that we've hypothesized is that maybe fishermen don't want to have to worry about getting run over by a ship. And so they don't fish as much at Geyer Bank. We certainly saw much less fishing gear on the bottom and much bigger fish, like these guys. So big schools of marble grouper. Each of these is uh, probably two and a half to three feet long. We saw aggregations of both adults as well as some juveniles, like this guy, and lionfish. So lionfish were present at every single site that we went to. Their highest abundance was at Geyer. So these are all juvenile marble grouper. And then at McGrail Bank, we were really surprised that right up there it, on the top, it did have a coral cap. Not quite as extensive as what we saw at East and West Flower Garden Banks, but 28% coral cover. So of those additional banks outside of Flower Garden Banks, it certainly has the highest coral cover and maybe should be one of the biggest priorities for protection moving forward. It was covered with both Montastri cavernosa, that star coral, as well as another uh, coral called Stephanocenia, sometimes called a blushing coral. If you come up to it and wave it, it retracts all of its tentacles and it turns kind of a pale pinkish white. But there was an interesting thing here, and that was sargassum overgrowth everywhere. In fact, if you look at some of the forward-facing video on the ROVs, it's almost hard to see the coral colonies, even if they're three or four feet across, because there was a forest of sargassum growing two or three feet up all the way around them. So it was only on those downward-facing shots that we could really see and measure the Stephanocenia well. So this uh, estimate of 28% coral cover is much, much higher than any of the previous surveys that have been done at McGrail. McGrail was one of the only banks that had, had any uh, really quantitative surveys done before we got out there. In addition to the shallow area, we have kind of this deeper zone in McGrail Bank. As you go off the southeast side of the bank, it turns into a true deep reef habitat. Big, tall, with corals. Lots of these white corals called uh, hypnogorgia, a number of madrasas here, and things like crinoids all over the place as well. So that's kind of the overall, here's what's on the bottom, here's why it's important overview. We were able to very clearly tie uh, commercially important fish like snapper and grouper to specific habitat areas across these different banks, and it tended to be along the margins. So this is an uh, instance where, you know, sometimes in designing MPAs, you try to preserve the middle and hope that you get spillover edge effects that help those things to move out of your MPA. This is an instance where it's going to be really important not to just protect the middle of that habitat area, but protect the margins of that habitat area as well. So moving on, we're going to talk about some more of the coral-specific work. So talking about the ecological and physiological difference, differences between the shallow and mesophotic individuals, as well as this idea of connectivity. 
And so for all of this work, we've really focused on one species, that Montastria cavernosa. You notice me saying it repeatedly in a lot of those different sites. It's really ubiquitous. It's a depth generalist, so we saw it at the shallow sites. You can see it you know, five feet deep here in Florida, all the way down to about 300 feet deep. So it's across that entire range. It's across the entire Gulf of Mexico and throughout essentially the whole tropical western Atlantic. So it's a really good model species for looking at connectivity between shallow and deep or between different areas horizontally. So it's present at all five of the banks we were studying. And it's an obligately symbiotic coral. So many shallow corals have this symbiotic relationship where they house small dinoflagellate algae within their bodies. They essentially farm them. So the algae are doing photosynthesis. They're providing sugars that the corals can use to grow. And the algae get essentially protected, less likely to be eaten, etc. So these guys are all symbiotic. They all have zooxanthellae. And you may hear me also call them symbiodinium, which is their genus, or zoax for short. So if we look at the individual cells, they look like these small spherical algal cells. One of the other interesting things about Montastri cavernosa is it has huge color variation. And that color variation can be driv driven by a, a number of different things. It can be driven by changes in pigments that are associated with the zooxanthellae. It can also be driven by pigments that are associated with other symbiotic organisms living on the coral. So one of the interesting things about this coral when it gets deep is you see these hot orange colonies. In addition to the zooxanthellae, they also have cyanobacteria that are doing photosynthesis with a completely different pigment type. So in other words, they're harvesting two different wavelengths of light in the same coral. So it's an adaptation to get more light in a potentially light-limited environment. Can you play that one for me? Thanks. So one of the ways that we sample the corals is with the ROV. So it has a small manipulator on it. The manipulator is about two inches wide, not very big. But it allows us to get these samples from down deep. And on any given dive, we can collect roughly six samples. That box on the left-hand side that you'll see extended right here. We can put partitions into it. Wait till another one pops up. We slide the box out. Here you can see those partitions. And we can drop individual corals into each of those different areas so that we don't mix and we know which sample came from where. We make sure that they're not sharing any of their tissue. So it's a pretty effective system. One of the challenges with the system is that it is up to the scientists, not the ROV pilots, to operate the manipulator. It's another case where video game training can behoove your success. So for every one of the corals that we collect, either with ROVs or with traditional hammer and chisel methods while on uh, diving, gets split out a number of different ways. The first thing we do is we take a subsample to do population genetics, looking at how the corals are related to one another, as well as gene expression, trying to look at which genes are being turned on and off in these individual corals. So the same way we turn on different genes in response to different stressors, so you know, or in response to good things. If you walk out of here and smell good food at 5 o'clock, your body's going to start turning on genes to make enzymes for digestion. If you walk outside and it's really, really hot, your body's going to start to turn on heat shock proteins. Corals turn off and on their genes the same way we do. And the genes that they turn off and on can tell us a lot about the environment they're being exposed to. So we do population and gene expression in one subsample. The second subsample looks like this until we blast all the tissue off. So we use a dental water pick, blast all the tissue off, and then spin it down. And here on the bottom, we've got all those algal cells. Here on the top is a little layer of animal tissue. So we can separate the animal tissue from the zooxanthellae as well. And then from each of these, we do a couple different things. First, for the little fragment, the piece that's left over, we 3D scan it. So here you can see this fragment is this fragment right here. So we render a 3D model of that fragment so we can calculate the exact surface area of that coral. So knowing the surface area means that we can then back calculate everything to per unit area. So the gene expression, we can back calculate the per unit area. The number of zooxanthellae can go back to per unit area. It's a way to standardize everything in a colonial organism. 
because you're not sampling the whole individual, you're only sampling a portion of it. We're also interested in morphometrics. Remember we talked about how shallow corals tend to mound up or branch, whereas mesophotic and deep corals tend to flatten out to maximize light. In addition to those changes, you can have changes in the individual little coral polyps themselves. And so uh, one of my grad students, Mike, is really interested in how those may change in response to different environmental conditions. So for this algal part, this little bit that comes off of each coral down here, we split it out three additional ways as well. So the first question is, what algae are there? So different species of symbiodinium have different ecological tolerances and can impart different characteristics to that coral that it's hosting. So we use something called next generation sequencing where we're actually looking at the bases in the DNA to identify that organism. We also look at the chlorophyll. So we just use standard spectrophotomic methods to look at how much chlorophyll is present. And again, we can calculate it back to per unit area. And we look at the number of zooxanthellae per unit area as well. So it's a whole suite of information that we're getting from each one of those little coral samples. So I try to assuage the fact that I feel bad about taking a coral sample with knowing how much data that little coral sample is going to get. So if we were to look at the number of zooxanthellae per unit area, so how many zooks are on that little spot of a coral, what we can see is that mesophotic corals contain more algae than their shallow water counterparts. So a shallow water coral may have this many zooxanthellae, whereas a mesophotic coral has a lot more. So this is a really strong uh, line of evidence that these shallow water corals are not light limited, and the deep water corals are having more zooxanthellae to try to capture more light so that they can do more photosynthesis and get their food. So we can see at west and east bank, this trend holds true. There essentially are no shallow corals to sample at McGrail Bank. But McGrail Bank was somewhat similar to east and west. In fact, McGrail Bank's just a little bit deeper, so it's not too surprising we see this slight trend of even more zooxanthellae at McGrail Bank. They're trying to comp compensate for being so shaded. The other question is, are they changing the amount of chlorophyll that they have? Remember, chlorophyll is what's in those cells that's actually going to absorb the light and allow photosynthesis to take place. So if we looked at East and West Bank and we compare uh, two different kinds of chlorophyll, A and C, whether from the shallow or mesophotic areas, we see that overall, per unit area, there is more chlorophyll. But we wanted to know whether or not that was driven by just the fact that there's more cells or if each cell had more chlorophyll. So is each cell also boosting the amount of pigments that it has? And what we found is that was not the case. They have the exact same amount of chlorophyll per cell. They just have a lot more cells. So that's the compensating mechanism, not making more chlorophyll. We've only got halfway there. We're looking at who is there in terms of the zooxanthellae. At the shallow sites, at least, it's remarkably consistent. It's the same kind of zooxanthellae this clade C type that was present in almost all of our samples. We just got back the mesophotic data on Friday. So Jen will be crunching that, and she can tell you more about that at her defense this summer. And then lastly, at looking at this idea of connectivity. So we have our sites at Flower Garden Banks. We have additional sites down in Belize at the Smithsonian's Carrie Bouquet uh, Research Station. We have sites at Pulley Ridge and the Dry Tortugas, who are part of a collaboration with another cooperative institute, CEMIS, uh, located down in Miami with the University of Miami. Um, and that's another NOAA-funded project. And so we have samples from this whole area. And we have this general trend of the loop current working in a clockwise direction through the Gulf of Mexico. So you might, so you might expect there to be some kind of connectivity that would allow these to be similar to one another. Now, these distances are too far for one individual coral larvae to make that entire trek and settle from Flower Garden Banks all the way to Pulley Ridge. So if there's any connectivity, it means there has to be some stepping stones along the way. Anyone remember what all those yellow dots are? All the oil rigs essentially provide habitat and substrate for a lot of these coral species. 
And so Paul Samarco uh, at LumCon has done a lot of work showing that they can indeed serve as stepping stones for population connectivity across this region. So we might expect there to be this trend of connectivity. We use something called microsatellites. Microsatellites are small repeats in the DNA. And the, having the same repeat within your DNA is a very strong indicator that you share some kind of common ancestor. So it's essentially a DNA fingerprinting technique. So you can look for those different repeats. And at one site within a piece of DNA, you may have three different character states. Someone has a short section of repeats, someone has a long section of repeats, or excuse me, a middle length section of repeats, that's our Goldilocks, and this one has the long section of repeats. And you can look and see which types they have. Now remember, corals are sexually reproducing, so they're going to get genes from their mom and from their dad, just like us, so they can have two alleles, just like us. So you can look to see whether they're homozygous, the same allele type, or heterozygous, for every single one of these microsatellite traits and fingerprint them. And what we found doing that is essentially very strong connectivity across all of flower garden banks, suggesting that it's very well mixed, that over generations, corals are moving back and forth from east to west, or larvae are moving back and forth from east to west, and it's all one population that we call pan-mictic, or can be managed all as one group. There is evidence of connectivity in a one-way fashion from Belize to flower gardens and from flower gardens down to dry tortugas. So that trend seems to hold, but we've got this outlier. Pulley Ridge wasn't necessarily connected to any of our sites, and this is work that my grad student Michael Studdivant has been working on. So this seems to be an outlier. So either the larvae are missing Pulley Ridge because it's deeper, flatter, not recruiting larvae to the area, or uh, somehow we're getting a shunt where things can be, maybe be going directly from Belize to dry tortugas and bypassing Pulley Ridge entirely. Both of those would be two explanations for the patterns that we're seeing. So what that means from a management perspective of this species is that you need to come up with some kind of system to, number one, preserve potential stepping stones. And we know that, those, that there were other natural stepping stones there before any of the oil rigs were in place. The age and life history of these corals suggests that there's additional populations along this coast, or at least there were additional populations along this coast at some point. The other thing we wanted to look at was how flexible in their physiology these corals were. So we're losing corals at an alarming rate in shallow reefs throughout the Caribbean, including here in Florida. And there's a suggestion that these deeper corals that are more protected and less likely to get impacted by, say, sea level rise, coastal inputs, um, bleaching from thermal stress, etc., can serve as a source of larvae that could reseed and help protect or restore our shallow reefs. And so what we wanted to look at was whether or not the existing genotypes that are present at the deep sites have the flexibility to move up shallow. So we've actually taken a number of corals off of these mesophotic, mesophotic sites, transplanted them up to shallow sites at both east and west flower garden banks, and we're going to track them to th for three years to see how all of those different metrics that we've been monitoring might change. Do they change their gene expression to act more like shallow water corals, are they flexible, or are they locked in to the genes they already have turned on? So how flexible are they in their life history and, and ecological strategies? And then we monitor things like temperature and light in both, loca both locations, because we know that temperature and light are probably going to be the strongest drivers of the responses of these corals. So. We're down here to our last one, provide data and recommendations for effective coral reef management, resource management. And so to that end, essentially every data product that we've developed in this, because it's been a direct collaboration with NOAA, we've just passed right along to them. One of the requirements of NOAA-funded projects is that within a certain time span, depending on the project, all of the data, or at least the metadata, has to be uploaded to a federal server, so it's publicly available data. So much of the data that I presented today, you could all go download and look at yourselves if you like. 
Uh, it's through CHORUS, the Coral Reef Information System. We produced three outreach videos that we shared with the, with the park, or excuse me, with the sanctuary, and the sanctuary has used those as outreach tools at their council meetings, so they can use them to educate the people that are interested in reefs there. Uh, we wrote about a 300-page book, um, and we were the lead on one of the chapters of that book that has gone to everyone within NOAA. And then the biggest thing, I think, is that through this data and information sharing, it helped the sanctuary to advocate for expansion. So with data in part from the three banks that we were at, it helped them to argue that these are important habitats that need to be protected. And we can back that up with its essential fish habitat. It has high coral cover. Uh, it's unique. And so now there's a proposal that is underway to expand flower garden banks from three banks to 12 total. So here's the three that we've contributed to, Brank, Bright, Geyer, and McGrail. And then there's other banks, Sonia, Alderdice, uh, McNeil, Rankin, and 28, basically closing the gap between east and west and expanding Stetson Bank as well. So this has been in process for uh, almost 19 months now. Public comment uh, ended last April. So it's now making its way through things like the Department of Commerce, and we're hopeful that within the next year, uh, at least a portion of these banks will move forward for additional protection. So some conclusions, outcomes, next steps. Mesophotic reefs are certainly more extensive than was previously known across the Northwest Gulf, Gulf of Mexico and are a candidate for additional protection, therefore. We know that the different banks and different habitat zones support different fisheries structure. So you can't say we're going to let this bank go and save this bank and expect to protect the same kind of fish habitat. They're different from one another. We know that coral algal symbioses display this light limitation response on mesophotic reefs. And we also see some evidence of connectivity broadly across the region and very tightly within East and West Flower Garden Bank. And the sanctuary is underway. There will still be additional opportunities for public comment for those of you that wish to be supportive or otherwise. And with that, I'd like to thank a number of people who have helped with this. Essentially, everyone over here on the left is from our lab at Harbor Branch, uh, teams from uh, NCOS and crews of the vessels that we worked with, our partners from UNCW, Jason and Lance, all of our partners at Flower Garden Banks, and then these are all of our additional NOAA and cost partners as well. Thank you guys all. I'll take a few questions. If you want to learn more, you can visit a few different web pages. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube. All three of those outreach videos are on the YouTube channel if you'd like to go look at them after this.